living in Texas. His work has been published by the Tin House blog, We Satch, The Huffington Post, The Toast, and adapted for radio by NPR, The Texas Standard. He's make, he makes a living as a political writer for progressive causes. He is currently working on a novel about Venezuela titled Freedom is a Beast. This part of the novel takes place in, in Venezuela in December 2012. It's a few months before Hugo Chavez uh, will pass away. Uh, it follows Maria, who's a 40-year-old uh, woman. Uh, she's a maid. She works for a family in Caracas, but lives in Petare. You're going to hear this name a lot. Petare is one of the biggest slums in Latin America, and it's kind of the barrio that surrounds Caracas. Um, her son, Eloy, has just been taken to prison. Um, and the other names you are going to hear are Maga, who's her, her best friend, and Willie, who is Eloy's best friend. And Maria blames him for uh, Eloy going to prison. The night sky was pitch black with rare December clouds, pregnant with water. December was a dry and chilly month in Caracas, especially up in the hills of Petare. Everyone was on edge even those without sons in prison. No one knew if President Chavez was dead or alive. In the barrio, some people, including Maga, were saying that he was already dead. That the photos of him and his daughters in a Cuban hospital bed, swollen and green like a ripe avocado, had been taken weeks ago. That Diosdado and Maduro had forwarded the photos to buy some time for strategic planning. They have to call for elections if he's dead, Maga had said. They're like vultures over a dead dog, trying to see who'll take the bigger piece. <clears throat> Maria refused to believe it. She was sure she would feel it in her soul and her bones if he died. In her dreams, she saw the barrio shake with sadness and split in two, ranchos falling into the, into the chasm left behind by the earthquake. She stopped by Chavez's portrait hanging above the plastic table. It was the only framed piece of art she had with the exception of a small picture frame with Eloy's high school graduation photo that sat next to her bed, Eloy and his bright grin. In contrast, Chavez's portrait was solemn, his expression hard to pin down. It was him in his military greens and red beret looking up to the horizon, lost in thought. One of the things Maria liked about it was that she could imagine Chavez thought different things depending on her own mood. When Eloy found a job right after high school, when he enrolled in Universidad Bolivariana a few years later, or when Maria herself started night school at Mission Rivas, inspired by her son, she saw the photo and felt Chavez must, must have been so proud of how far she'd come. But now, when Eloy had been thrown in some hole so far away from her, when the night approached menacing and outside the do her door, things looked pretty much the same as they always had, or worse. She thought that Chavez must have been thinking how much more was needed, how gargantuan the obstacle that Venezuela presented. Maybe that's why he was looking so far off, like somehow saying it would take a long time to get things right. Maria didn't know where to go, but she knew if she stayed in her house one more second, she would start screaming and probably never stop. She thought of Eloy locked in somewhere in some room or cell, and the walls around her suddenly moved closer. Or maybe it was her sadness slowly making her bloat and expand into some kind of grieving giant, making her rancho seem smaller as she grew. She busted out the door, gasping for air. As a rule, she didn't go out at night. In fact, she didn't remember the last time she had been out of her house after nine. It was as if she lived in a place where after a certain hour, the air turned nauseous where mist of green poison rolled through the Caracas Valley and climbed the hills of Petare and parked itself licking the outer walls of the small houses and ranchos that made up the barrio. Good people like her found shelter in their homes, hoping that the mist would remain outside, and mostly it did. Others fed on that venom. They filled their lung with it in big, greedy gulps. It made them drunk, violent, and loud. It made their muscles bulge and their souls shrivel. They reveled in the Petare night like kings and queens of the underworld. It was their barrio at night. They had bought it with lead and blood long ago. She walked past locked houses, 
the lights inside still on, but the doors barred until morning. As she descended the hill, she saw young men, younger than Eloy, but children no longer, smoking outside the bars and whorehouses of Calle Carabobo. Women clung to them like fleshy purses made of tight red leather and yellow sequins. Some were beautiful, but most of them added to the sadness Maria carried on her back. Their dresses too tight or too short, their teeth rotten or missing, their eyes searching. The familiar bass rhythm of reggaeton and the crooning of vallenatos busted out of establishment doors and fought in the streets like packs of mangy dogs. Maria loved music like this. She danced while cleaning the beautiful rooms of Casa Verde when La Señora had gone for errands. It was a joy to feel the rhythm invading her hips, the feel of the broom on her right hand making do as dance partner. But in this context, the music warped into something ugly and dangerous, like a pretty girl in front of a funhouse mirror. She stared at them, these denizens of the Petare night, looking for something inside them that she could recognize in herself, some set of small dignities to cling to and say, we are the same, you and I. But with the darkness and the clouds starting to spit on them and the light of the bars creating only silhouettes, she could not find anything. Would Aloy be hanging out here if he had not been taken from her? Willie would. In fact, she saw Willie's face in every one of the men, in the ones leaning on the bar's peeling walls, in the ones drinking out of flasks and cans and plastic cups, in the ones holding tight to the plump, uncovered waists of petare whores. The only thing in her heart for Willie, contempt and judgment. She cried then and sat on the curb, she couldn't tell if the water hitting the sidewalk was her own tears or the rain starting to come down in a steady downpour. The men and women flung their cigarettes or stepped on them or gently put them out and stuck them in their pockets and made for shelter. She stood up and started to make her way back home. Whatever she was looking for was not here. 